of us have a responsibility to ourselves, to our children, to each other. We intend to be sure that everybody in this room and every child in this state is somebody. No matter where they're born, no matter to whom they are born, our children's future is shaped both by the values of their parents and the policies of their nation. I know from my own experiences and from the conversations I've been privileged to have with thousands of our fellow citizens across this country that something is wrong with our health care system and that it needs to be fixed. I got a lot of advice from Ann about my hair. And one time I was with Ann and she sort of looked at me in that way she had and she said, you know, Really, you got to make up your mind. <laughs> you either just have to do something that people forget about and pay no attention to, or you got to make a statement. <laughs> Although we weren't able to shatter that highest, hardest glass ceiling this time, thanks to you, it's got about 18 million cracks in it. <laughs> I believe that now, on the eve of a new millennium, it is time to break the silence. It is time for us to say here in Beijing, and for the world to hear, that it is no longer acceptable to discuss women's rights as separate from human rights. If there is one message that echoes forth from this conference, let it be that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights once and for all. I also recall very well, as others of you in this room may, that there were certain schools I couldn't apply to when I was ready to apply to college because they didn't admit girls. There were certain scholarships and fellowships I wasn't eligible to apply for because they didn't take girls. And that is all within one lifetime relatively short lifetime that I like to think of it as. And the changes that have occurred in just 25 years have been startling and wonderful. To the young people in particular, I hope you will hear this. I have, as Tim said, spent my entire adult life fighting for what I believe in. I've had successes and I've had setbacks, sometimes really painful ones. Many of you are at the beginning of your professional, public, and political careers. You will have successes and setbacks too. This loss hurts, but please never stop believing that fighting for what's right is worth it. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Isn't it great to have Hillary Rodham Clinton in Austin, Texas? <laughs> the video you just saw was created. Uh, Paul Steckler led a group of RTF and LBJ students, and the LBJ students did this film. And they worked with one of my producers. Um, Spencer Gilliam at GSDNM, and the only input that I had was the one about Ann Richards and the hair. <laughs> I had to do it, right? I had to, honey, you got to do something about this statement. Anyway, uh, yeah, congratulations to the film students who did that, and it's, America, it's part of this idea that young people, you can do anything. So, you really can't. It was uh, August uh, in 1972. I know I look fabulous. But anyway, um, <laughs> when a guy named Gary Morrow, I don't know if you're around, and a woman named Judy Trabolsi and Nancy Williams, we were all 23 years old, 1972. And we were 
kids trying to turn out the 18-year-old vote. It's just gotten 18-year-old vote uh, in the George McGovern presidential race, which went extremely well. <laughs> and uh, we get it. We had a tiny little office, and we get a knock on the door. And they, I open up the door, and this guy says, "Roy, my name's Bill Clinton." And uh, I'm taking leave of absence from Yale Law School to come down here and help McGovern. That's good, isn't it? <laughs> and then, of course, hi, I'm Hillary Rodham. And uh, I actually have been here, and she had been here for four months, a leave of absence from Yale Law School to register votes in San Antonio and South Texas and stop voter fraud. Does that sound familiar? God bless her. And we, Taylor Branch, was here, and we were kids, 23 years old, running McGovern's campaign. And while we came up short, or another person said we got clobbered, but you know, it's, it's a difference in words. Um, Hillary and Bill, and Gary Morrow, Judy, and I became friends forever because we hit, were in the arena together at 23 years old. There are two women on the front row named Lucy and Linda. I don't have to say their last names, but. Uh, they know a little something about being in the arena too. Because their father, Lyndon Johnson, and their mother, Lady Bird, were in the arena all their lives. One story that people don't know a lot about President Johnson is he walked door to door in the rural areas when he was like 28 years old. And he got the rural co-op electricity for the rural areas. And I'm glad because in Brownwood we didn't have it back then. And he turned the lights on. He turned the lights on in rural America. And Lucy, and whether they wanted to be or not, and Linda were in that arena with them every single day, especially in the arena of human rights and social justice, an opportunity for all in the environment. And they have been in the arena ever since. So give these two women a huge hand for being there. So Hillary Rodham Clinton on this day on November 13th, 2018, on the campus of the LBJ School and the University of Texas in Austin, I'm not speaking for your mom and dad, but I think President and Lady Bird Johnson are looking down with tears in their eyes and pride and love in their heart for being able to celebrate the tribute to Hillary Rodham Clinton who from childhood was called to serve, to serve others in the arena of life as a child. No matter how hard, no matter how tough, no matter the calls to quit or give up, Hillary has never paid any attention to those calls. You know why? Because she's always heard a higher calling. And that higher calling was her belief system that everyone everywhere, everyone everywhere should have a chance and opportunity to live up to their God-given potential. <laughs> Especially women and girls. So on April the 23rd, 1910, Theodore Roosevelt, gave the now famous Tom Johnson speech in Paris called Man in the Arena. Man in the Arena. Today, 108 years later, right here in the Lady Bird Johnson Auditorium with the LBJ Foundation members so championing this idea of Hillary in the arena and with the friends and families that we've known forever, and especially the younger generation 
the next generation who will be in the arena. And our amazing and fierce and fair and passionate dean of the LBJ School, Angelina Evans. Angela's amazing. Hillary Rodham Clinton will receive the first ever LBJ School in the arena tribute, woman in the arena. Dean Evans, please come on up and let's get this thing going and I appreciate all of you. How's everybody? Good? Yeah, this is quite a night. Uh, in any celebration like this, it's really important to know there's a lot of people who work behind the scenes to make this happen. And so I really do want to thank all of those who just work and just seat you and make it very comfortable. Uh, to thank them for all of their hard work over this last week. And I was telling Secretary Clinton uh, in the back room that the whole school, the energy in the school was so different. Uh, it was like the school raised about four feet off the ground because she was going to be here. And a lot of people made that happen. And I really want to say thank you to the foundation. Uh, you've just been so generous to the school always, and this is just a particularly very poignant moment for me as a dean and for the school. In addition, um, you know, Roy talked about the students who did the video. We were very fortunate because the actual award, which you'll see in a minute, was created and designed. Your programs were designed by a group of extraordinarily talented undergraduate students in the College of Fine Arts, led by, yes. <laughs> led by an extraordinary woman. Her name is Professor Jiwan Park. And Jiwan, you want to stand up for a second? <laughs> there was competition among this class, and we actually selected one. We could have selected many of them. But the one we selected, we want the three students who were the creators of this award to stand. One is Michael Johnston, Jr., Jenna Ma, and Nadir Sadaway. Yeah. It's a tribute to the university and to Mrs. Clinton that everybody was so anxious to get this started. And this started in September, and they did an extraordinary job. So now let's, let's get going. It's my honor, truly my honor, to present the inaugural In the Arena Award to a woman whose life perfectly captures the spirit of Teddy Roosevelt's speech in Paris more than a century ago, as Roy said. The speech was a scathing indictment of those cold and timid souls who sit in judgment while others do the work. But above all, it was a siren call to public service. One that a young woman from Illinois would answer nearly four decades later, and perhaps more than any other public figure in modern American history has come to embody that award and that saying. It's impossible to understand Hillary Clinton and her relationship to public service apart from the era in which she was raised and how she matured. Uh, she, was, uh, she was a civic activist at a time when America was consumed by big dreams, civil rights, the Peace Corps, the moon landing, all these incredibly innovative, energetic things that were going on in our society. It was a time of political awakening when people of all ideological stripes were embracing their responsibilities as citizens of a free society. Several presidents, including LBJ, whose name our school bears, would echo President Roosevelt's call to action. Americans, especially young Americans, heeded that call. They were energized and excited, and they got involved. Hillary Clinton is a product of that era, driven to public service by a deep and unwavering belief in the power of government to improve people's lives. Few political leaders today have such a distinguished record of public service and are as marred by dust and sweat 
as Secretary Clinton. Fewer still have gone so courageously into that arena or so many times as Mrs. Clinton. As a long, young lawyer, she worked to improve child welfare, and she's been devoting her whole life to child welfare and health. She continued her work in this area when she was First Lady of Arkansas and First Lady of the United States of America, and she redefined those roles for those who came after her. She was twice elected senator from New York, making her the first former First Lady to serve in the U.S. Senate. After President Obama defeated her in 2008 in the Democratic primary, she set politics and personal ambition aside to serve as his Secretary of State. Eight years later, she made history as the first female presidential candidate of a major political party. Think about this. Think about her career. There is, as President Roosevelt so eloquently declared, no effort without error or shortcoming. Secretary Clinton is no exception, but if you want to be blameless, stay on the sidelines. If you want to make a difference, you have to be daring to get in the middle of that arena and mess it up. When future rent generations look back at Secretary Clinton's life and career, I have no doubt it will be an admiration of a woman who at every turn, and even in the face of defeat, dusted herself off, got back up, rolled up her sleeve, and she reclaimed the mantle of public service. They will denounce the vitriol in future generations of what she's endured, which now even veers its ugly head on conspiracy and insults and threats of violence and even calls of imprisonment. And they will wonder at how over and over and over again, she persevered. In a speech to her graduating class at Wellesley, Secretary Clinton gave us a glimpse of the battle-ready public servant she was ready to become. She said, quote, fear is always with us, but we just don't have time for it. I hope every single student at the LBJ School and the University of Texas leave their educational career with the same sense of urgency and belief in the power of public service to make things better. And I hope each of you pursues, pursues your passions with the same courage, toughness, and conviction that Secretary Clinton has displayed. Now, it is my pleasure to present to Secretary Clinton the first ever In the Arena Award. First of all, thank you. I'm so honored, and this is the most beautiful award. You said it's it's meant to be sort of a torch. A torch. Yes. And, um, the students did a lot with thinking about how you're. It's a very uh, kinetic uh, piece of work, and how it shows that you know it's just a spiral. It's three turns, and I'm telling you, this was just an amazing. Uh, exercise for them because what they had to do is they had to think about what it meant to be in the arena, what were some of the different terminology, and how do you make that something that you is a physical structure. So well, I just want to congratulate them. It's incredible. Thank you so very, very much. So 
So Secretary Clinton, you've been in the arena for a long time. What I would like you to talk to us about is how do you see that changing? And uh, from the time you stepped in and now, and where do you see this in the future? What kinds of elements are you going to be seeing in that arena to help us think through how we can prepare students and ourselves to stay in? Well, I was um, backstage uh, listening to your introduction, and you were talking about um, what it felt like to be a young person in the 1960s. Uh, and the extraordinary sense of possibility that we all experienced. Um, you know, it, it, really, it really was just a, an amazing time in American history. And I know both Linda and Lucy are with us tonight. And what was accomplished um, that set a standard uh, to uh, strive for that we could uh, afford to go to college, that our government was investing in education, that the elderly and the poor would have health care, that little children would have a head start, that we would, as President Kennedy had said, uh, get to the moon by the end of the decade. There was so much that was aspirational about it. So being in the arena felt like we were all pulling in the same direction. We were all heading uh, to that common ground, that higher ground, as, as my longtime friend Roy Spence talks about, um, on, on a mission uh, on behalf of America. It didn't mean it was you know, all rainbows and, and puppy dogs. I mean, it was hard. Uh, it was uh, fraught with tragedy, assassinations, first of President Kennedy and then of Dr. King and, and Bobby Kennedy. Um, the Vietnam War was a real challenge uh, that had to be dealt with, but people were alive and they were committed and involved in uh, all of the issues of the day. Uh, so it was a different feeling. Uh, there were disappointments, there were setbacks, but there wasn't the devaluing of government and politics and the cynicism that is used to discourage people and turn them away from uh, common effort. So in that sense, being in the arena did feel as Teddy Roosevelt described it. Um, the, it wasn't the critic who counted, it was the man, or I would say the person, uh, in the arena who was striving. And, uh, I think we're, we have to rebuild that, and we have to look for ways that light the same spark of uh, energy uh, put to the use of individuals and all of us together uh, making a difference. And I think that is beginning to uh, happen again, but it doesn't happen by accident. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about, um, with this with our students, in terms of stepping into something where you have to persist, where you have to have patience, where you have to find common ground, where you have to think about areas where you agree. And we talked a little bit about this with the students uh, in the class um, today. And I think this is hard for them because they're very impatient and, there's, and you know their whole, like you're saying, their era is very different than our era was. So what kind of advice would you give them um, well, we had a great discussion with um, about 50 students um, that uh, asked unbelievably great questions, uh, a real, really positive reflection on them and also on the school. Um, but this, this issue about the time in which uh, you live, uh, the time and place in which your arena exists, is a very important one because we have become less patient. We have become, to some extent, um, almost manipulated by the way that uh, politics is talked about and covered and it discourages a lot of people and if it doesn't happen quickly, uh, it doesn't seem like it's worth pursuing and actually, you can go back to the beginning of our country or even much further back in history, and having that commitment that keeps you going through good times and hard, through the successes and the failures, 
is the only thing that ever does finally produce results. And I think a lot about this because, you know, just as one quick example, um, as you saw from the film, you know, when I was working on trying to begin to move us toward universal health care back in 93, 94, I mean, it was incredibly difficult and it did not succeed. And that was, uh, you know, personally very disappointing, but not so much for me uh, because, you know, I would have health care, but for the countless people who did not um, and who would be, you know, left just scrabbling to try to find uh, what they needed for themselves and their children. Um, so what we did after we, you know, tried to figure out what we could do, what we could get accomplished, was to come up with something called the Children's Health Insurance Program. And I began talking to Democrats and Republicans um, on Capitol Hill, starting in the Senate, to see if we couldn't devise a program that would have the support needed to pass. Uh, and we did. And, you know, it provided health care since uh, 19, you know, the late 90s, about 9 or 10 million kids a year. Now, it wasn't everything. It wasn't what we had started out to try to achieve, but we didn't give up and we didn't get discouraged because if you're in the arena, you can't, in my experience, be there just for your own gratification. If you're not there on behalf of a cause larger than yourself and you face a setback, well, it's hard to keep going. But if you know that what you're trying to do in this case uh, is make sure that all the children and their parents who I had met traveling across the country trying to put piece together a health care reform would be really left behind, you know, that can get you up in the morning and that can make you, you know, go, you don't take the criticism personally, you take it seriously because you want to learn from it, but you don't get stopped, uh, you keep going. And I think those are lessons we all have to, you know, be reminded of, and particularly today when the news coverage of politics has shrunk so much, it's really hard to get accurate information. Uh, social media rewards us if we are uh, pushed into our corners, you know, kind of yelling across the divide. To try to find the, the center of yourself and of the arena, to try to maintain your focus, uh, it takes a lot of discipline, but it's the only way in a big, raucous, uh, diverse, uh, political system like ours that I think you can actually get the progress you're seeking. One of the things that we've been talking about today, and you said it several times, but not this way. Um, sometimes when you have to make a decision, your head and your heart do not agree. So when you've had those kinds of tensions between your head and your heart, uh, where have you found yourself to be most right? Which one have you listened to where it's taken you in the right place? Well, f for me, as someone who started off my career as a young lawyer with the Children's Defense Fund, uh, working uh, to help kids who were neglected, abused, impoverished, lacking health care, uh, shut out from school because they had a disability, it was certainly my heart that was pushing me forward, that attracted me uh, to this work, uh, probably because of the really difficult childhood that uh, my own mother experienced and my feeling that you know, we, we could uh, and should do more to help kids. But I learned a really important lesson, um, that the heart can only take you so far. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to work for the Children's Defense Fund after I graduated from Yale Law School, uh, one of the first jobs I had was going door to door uh, in a place called New Bedford, Massachusetts, gathering information about children who were denied schooling uh, in 1973 because they had a disability. Because my mentor and my boss, Marion Wright Edelman, who started the Children's Defense Fund, knew that emotion and heart without evidence, facts, argument, um, wouldn't necessarily get you where you wanted to go. So we were part of a big nationwide effort to collect this data. And what we did, we looked at census data, we looked at 
uh, enrollment data in schools, and we saw there was a delta, there was a difference. There were you know, X number of kids between the ages of five and 18, but there were fewer than that number in school. And so we went door to door. And we gathered all this information, then we aggregated it, and then we put together um, the evidence that children were being denied schooling in order to go to the Congress and get uh, you know, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act passed. So I, I learned, and it was, it was a lesson I had to keep learning, that asserting something, talking about how wrong something is, and making the case from your heart opens the door mm -hmm. and maybe gathers you some allies and, and creates some excitement, but you have to go the next step with your head to say, and, and here's how we're going to do it, and here's why it matters, and, and that's what we had to do with the Children's Health Insurance Program is to make the case, um, and we made it you know, both from our heart that it was wrong uh, to deny these children in our country health care, and we made it from our head because the argument was, you know, it's a lot better for a child to be able to see a doctor regularly than to end up in the emergency room. And so actually, uh, if you don't care about these kids, if you don't see it as a moral issue, if your heart is not beating harder because you want to do something to help them, then think about it as a way of saving money. Um, so that's the, the kind of dance that you're always uh, in when you're trying to get change, when you're trying to make a case. Uh, you know, if you just speak to the converted, you know, they'll cheer and yell and, and you know, be on your side. But once you get out of the, uh, <laughs> you know, the crowd that agrees with you already, you still have to make the case. And, you know, I, I said earlier in talking with the students, you know, personally, it's just hard for me to accept from either my heart or my head that Texas has the highest uninsured rate in the entire country and now has a maternal mortality rate that is equivalent to some third world countries. So lead with your heart because women are dying in this state and people are being denied health care but then make the argument and try to keep hammering at the opposition. I think one of the challenges <laughs> I think one of the challenges, uh, and I hope it's not the new normal, is that there is this, quote, fake news, you know, where people really don't want facts. Or where do you go for facts? Where do you go for authoritative information? Where do you go to trust what you're hearing? Because there's so many sources of information now. So how do you how do you judge when you've got really solid information, enough for you to make a decision or to take a stand on something? Well, you know, Angela, I think this is one of the biggest threats to our democracy. You know, we can have strongly held opinions that differ from one another. That is what you expect. Um, but if you can't even agree on a foundation of factual information on what is um, evidence to present a case or to make a decision, it is very difficult uh, to imagine democracy which requires this kind of uh, joint decision making uh, to flourish. So I worry so much about both the, what I would call um, inadvertent attacks on facts, evidence, uh, truth, reason, and the deliberate ones uh, that are designed to uh, undermine um, your own understanding of what's at stake and how you can judge the information you're getting. So it's, it's troubling when uh, you see, uh, as we currently have, an administration that is trying to confuse people, disorient people, uh, change the, uh, the environment in which we make decisions. And you do have to work a lot harder. You know, if you go back and look at news coverage of uh, politics, and particularly of presidents, you know, going back to the 60s, but really until relatively recently, there was a lot more news presented, not so much opinion, and more time was given to it. So. 
I don't remember the exact number of seconds that the so-called nightly news uh, would cover President Johnson or President Reagan or uh, it, it kept going down, but it wasn't a precipitous fall. But now people talk about how you know the average uh, viewer on either what we consider you know broadcast or cable news or social media has an attention span of about eight seconds. So if you don't grab them in those eight seconds, if you don't get their attention, you know they're not going to click on you, and you're not going to get the ads that you would get if more people clicked. So. It's in the interests of the purveyors of information to be as controversial, eye-catching as possible, to oversimplify and try to make a case that is going to grab eyeballs. And that makes it even harder um, because it's not necessarily being done for a nefarious political purpose. It's being done because it's a you know, commercial enterprise, and the way we now judge is what your digital, uh, you know, footprint looks like. So that's one problem that we've got to figure out how to deal with, and there's people like Tom Johnson and others who know a lot more about this than I ever will. I don't know how you figure out both um, the best way that commercial uh, news can be delivered uh, in a more fact-based, uh, thoughtful way. And then you've got the whole other issue of deliberate uh, uh, falseness. And you know that started on the very first day of the current administration. I mean, I've been to a number of inaugurations now, and the crowd was not that big, let me just tell you. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and, and then to be, you know, like not only told but but ordered to believe it was um, was troubling. That was really unlike anything that I had ever seen. I mean, people shade the truth. They try to put themselves in the best light. We all know that. That's human nature. Nature, not just politics. But to try to convince you that what you saw was not true and instead another version, an alternative fact, of which there are no such things, was, <laughs> that's different. Mm -hmm. So we have to approach this, I think, in, in two different ways. And we have to keep looking uh, to try to find you know, the best information possible. And we have to help educate our kids so that they can be better consumers of the news. And that's going to be, I think, a a big challenge for families and public education because we can't, you know, we just can't let our kids be captured by uh, these uh, purveyors of falsehoods uh, and not have the tools to be able to work their way through it. I think that's one of the challenges now because you, you couple that with impatience or you couple that with immediate satisfaction and then you're also trying to say, well, is this true, is it not true, and I don't have time to go and look at all of the, the different sources. And so people go to the source that they feel most comfortable with. So one of the ideas is try to see a lot of different sources and try to make your own way. But that's very difficult, and especially for young people, uh, to try to do that. So that's the problem. I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, in the clip you say, many of you are at the beginning of your professional, public, and political careers. You will have successes and you will have setbacks, but please never stop believing that fighting for what is right is worth it. How encouraged are you by the increase in the number of women and minorities who ran in the 2018 uh, election? And you know there are more cracks in that 18 million now. And how encouraged are you about that? Oh, you know I am I am just amazingly encouraged um, and feel so positive about the numbers of uh, first-time candidates. Uh, you know the diversity of those candidates, the campaigns that they ran. Uh, it was thrilling for me uh, to see so many people, particularly uh, women, uh, lots of young women, but women uh, of uh, older ages as well, you know, stepping into the arena exactly. and being willing to subject themselves to the you know, slings and arrows that come your way when you uh, vie for political office. 
And the outcomes were so encouraging too, because I mean, the, the diversity was not just diversity in you know, race or in uh, background. Uh, it, it was a diversity that really showed you the full range of um, who we are as Americans. And I can't wait to see uh, a picture of the new Congress uh, because there are more women than ever before uh, in our entire history. Uh, there are more people of color. Uh, they're the first two Native Americans ever elected uh, to our Congress. So. I, I, was, I, I was so, I mean, I started an organization called Onward Together uh, shortly after the election because I wanted to look for a way to support groups that were going to continue fighting uh, for progressive causes and uh, democratic candidates. And I support about a dozen of these groups. And it's been thrilling because they help recruit candidates and train candidates. And then they help to support them uh, through their election. And uh, today, as I mentioned to the students, is uh, Run for Office Day. Mm -hmm. And I did a video uh, last night for one of the groups called Run for Something that is already beginning to recruit candidates for races that are in some places next year and then obviously for 2020. That is what it's going to take. Mm -hmm. The more people we can get into the arena um, who care about uh, the common that challenges, uh, who share the common concerns, who are willing to seek the common solutions, the more people we can get, then you begin to change the political uh, dialogue. And, then people are going to demand, not just that you appeal to their already existing uh, feelings and beliefs, but that you come with some ideas about what can actually better deliver health care or make finally uh, college affordable for everybody or deal with uh, climate change or gun safety measures. People are going to, I think, be inspired who are not only running but voting to really demand more from candidates. Um, and, and demanding it not just in rhetoric, but in, in real thoughtfulness and planning. You know, I was, I, you know, I was kind of um, criticized and made fun of uh, in uh, the 2016 campaign, because I really did give a lot of thought about what we could do and what would work. Uh, and I kept thinking that that would matter. Uh, kind of didn't uh, at the end, but I, I really did believe that if you run for whatever it might be, from local, state, federal level, you owe it to the people who you are asking to vote for you to tell them what you will do. Not just to spout rhetoric and not just to make claims, but to really have a conversation because in a very real way, it's like a job interview. So what are you gonna do that will make life better uh, for the people you wanna serve? And that, I think, is beginning to happen. I really feel like there was a lot of great um, uh, talk in this campaign about what we're gonna do. And that will, that will fuel you through um, the hard times as well as the successful times once you're in office. One of our own, Stacey Abrams, she's a graduate of the LBJ School, is in the arena right now. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I, I know Stacy well. She was one of my uh, really strong um, surrogates in the campaign. If she'd had a fair election, she already would have won. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that really goes to the point of how you have to stay in the arena. You can't just be in the arena, you know, win an election, pass a piece of legislation, and then kind of say goodbye, I'm done, you have to stay in the arena. And voting rights is a perfect example of this. Um, I, when I was talking to the students, I talked about how absolutely captivated I was by President Johnson's uh, 1965 um, speech about the Voting Rights Act, and how thrilled I was to have been a very small part in advocating to drop the voting age from 21 to 18. Uh, you know, a few years later. 
and how I thought that issue was behind us. One person, one vote. I mean, what's you know, complicated about that? And to see the continuing distortion of democracy, the perversion of politics by the many ways that are being employed to discourage people from voting, to suppressing their vote, to purging them from uh, the voting rolls, to not counting their votes, is just maddening. But it has to motivate us to get into and stay in the arena. And, you know, working at the county or municipal level to make sure that people are registered to vote and then to make sure uh, that uh, they are allowed to vote when they show up and all of that, that is hard, hard work. That is the boring of hard boards, as Max Weber would say. <laughs> and we need more people willing to do it as well as to be poll watchers and election officials. This is how we govern ourselves. And unfortunately, there are those on the other side who have spent uh, the last 10 years undoing uh, the Voting Rights Act, thanks to the Supreme Court, which defied a, uh, an overwhelming vote to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act, because I was there and voting for it, and George W. Bush signed it, then the Supreme Court said, oh, we don't need it anymore, and you can see the results. So Stacy is, I talked to her the other day, she is really in the arena, and she is fighting for the right to vote and have your vote counted. And I don't know what the outcome will be, but God bless her for continuing that fight and not yeah. walking away. Our democracy really is very precious, isn't it? And it's very fragile. Yes. Um, we were talking about this before, and if you don't have people who are willing to step in the arena, people taking risks and risking failure and risking uh, people's ire, then we aren't going to be able to preserve this republic. And we talked about this. Um, with age <laughs> and maturity comes a little bit more freedom. And what I'm thinking about here about asking you is, there's freedom from people's expectations of what you should be. You know, you should be this, and you should be that, and you should look like this, or you should behave like this. And when you're older and a little bit more mature, um, you have freedom to do something different. Did you have that transition? Can you identify a time when you thought, aha, you know, now I'm at a point where I've been there, done that, and now I have enough bona fides and standing that I'm not going to pay too much attention to what people think. I'm going to do what I really want to do. Well, I think that does come with time and experience. Um, and I certainly, um, I, I, I certainly uh, understand um, that feeling that you know, I you just have to you have to be yourself. You have to believe what you believe. You have to again, if you're in the arena, stand for what you think is right. Um, but it is difficult as a woman in the yeah. political arena uh, to be totally uh, free from that worry. Uh, it is something that you can't escape. It is omnipresent, and you ignore it to the best of your ability, but it still is you know, bearing down on you. You're being judged all the time, and it is something that you have to get used to and to kind of get over, um, but you can't totally ignore it, if, that, if you understand what I'm saying. I do, because yes. I, I think sometimes it's sad in some yeah. ways, uh, because with maturity, you think like, okay, I've, I've done things, I have accomplishments, I am who I am, and that's mm -hmm. good, uh, and that's how I'm going to react. Uh, but there's just pressures coming in that there's an expectation uh, around you that you should be, you should act this way or that way. Right. And well, you know, I, I, in this, you know, in the book I wrote after the election, uh, what happened, um, and I, I told the students earlier, I had to write it because I had to figure out what happened, and so it was a, <laughs> a real passion project. Um, I have a whole chapter about uh, women uh, in uh, politics, and I, I not only drew on examples from my own experience, uh, but also uh, looked at some of uh, the other women who I know because they're all aware of this. So, for example, um, I have given 
hundreds, maybe thousands of speeches over the years. And I have given speeches, um, you know, preceding or following men many, many, many times. And I have been on podiums or platforms or stages where, you know, the man who was running or holding the office or maybe my opponent, you know, is really worked up. They're, you know, they're, they're maybe making a point strongly. They're yelling. They might even be pounding the podium. Um, that is hard for a woman to do. Um, and I've always been interested in the difference in reaction about uh, women's voices and women's presentations in public. Uh, there's a famous uh, classic scholar at Cambridge University who wrote a, a small book about women in power uh, that came out about, I don't know, earlier this year, I think. And she communicated with me a few times um, during the election uh, because she said, you know, some of the things that are said about you uh, go back to the Greeks and the Romans. <laughs> and she, she sent me an excerpt from the Odyssey. <laughs> and uh, her name is Mary Beard, if you want to get her book. So uh, in the Odyssey, you know, Penelope is holding down the fort. I mean, it's not easy, you know? <laughs> her husband has been gone for a decade, and far as she knows, he's never coming back, but she's trying to keep the kingdom intact and fend off the suitors who, you know, want to inherit uh, the wealth of the kingdom and all of that. So, I mean, every day she's down there, you know, she's knitting and she's nodding her head and she's trying to keep all these people at bay. And she has a son called Telemachus. And so Telemachus becomes a teenager, maybe 15, 16 years old. And one day, Penelope comes down from the women's quarters as she has for a decade. And she starts to speak. And all of a sudden, her son says, mother, return to your quarters. Women have no business speaking in public. And so, Mary Beard sends me this, and she says, this is a very long tradition, and <laughs> we are somewhat beyond it, but not completely free from it. So then I saw uh, Elizabeth Warren on the floor of the Senate, a place I served eight years, and it's the debate over Jeff Sessions to become Attorney General. Uh, just happened in the blink of an eye. And so... Um, <laughs> She, uh, she's reading from a letter by Coretta yes. Scott King about some of um, Jeff Sessions' prior behavior and positions, and Mitch McConnell goes to the floor of the Senate, I had never saw this happen, and told her to cease um, speaking because she was impugning uh, a, a colleague, a fellow senator, and, I mean, she, she tries to start up again, and he orders her off the floor and says, you know, she was told to stop, but nevertheless, she persisted. Now, following Elizabeth after she leaves the floor is a Democrat, male Democratic senator who comes to the podium and finishes reading the letter and nobody says anything. Yeah, or Senator Kamala Harris is questioning, uh, I think it was Jeff Sessions, in uh, uh, a committee hearing, and you know, she's a former prosecutor, and she was sort of bearing down on him, and she was admonished by the chair, you know, not, you know, not to talk that way to him. I mean, I don't know if any of you watched the Kavanaugh hearings, um, but you saw perfect examples of, there were some men who were pretty worked up on the other side of the aisle, and there were some women who were insulted by the witness. And everybody just kind of swallowed it. Mm -hmm. So you can free yourself and you can look at what happens to you in the arena and try to figure out the best way to handle it. And you can try to be as... Uh, oblivious of it or uh, resistant to it as possible, but you can't escape what the environment is. So it's a, 
it's a it's a balancing act that uh, most of the women that I know who've been in politics go through all the time. And you know, everything becomes uh, a way of uh, presenting yourself and protecting yourself. So the clothes you wear or the hairstyle you have, uh, all of that is part of the persona you present. And you know, you hopefully are comfortable with it, confident in it, uh, but you also are well aware that you're gonna be uh, judged by it. I think this is where when we were talking about how the arena changes when we started this conversation. If the arena doesn't change, it's gonna be like this. If the arena brings in more diversity, brings in more women, brings in people uh, you know, of different regions and colors and shapes and sizes, then that arena becomes different. That's right. And that's what I hope happens. That's what I believe is finally happening. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I think is very important is leadership. And in one of your books, um, when I was reading about um, you, it says, you said something like, uh, in this republic is precious and you have to earn leadership. Right. Leadership has to be earned. Can you talk about to us what you believe? How do you earn leadership? You know, I, I really believe that. I mean, it doesn't always turn out that way, but in most instances, um, if you're seeking political leadership, uh, you have to be prepared. I mean, you have to, I mean, well, there are mm. exceptions, but you're supposed to. <laughs> you're supposed to be prepared. You're supposed to have thought about what you uh, would like to accomplish. Uh, you're supposed to, in a democracy, learn how to listen as well as talk, uh, be in a position to gather information from people, then to try to put it uh, to use on their behalf. Uh, I was thinking, you know, one of the programs that I'm, I'm very proud of that uh, uh, the LBJ School, uh, both Bush libraries plus uh, the Clinton Library do is called the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. Now, people are taken sort of mid-career and given a chance to work uh, on problems and travel to all four of the uh, libraries, including right here, uh, to listen to people. Uh, and you know what happens? They actually are amazed that spending time with people who are so different from themselves is worth their time. Mm -hmm. They learn things. It's so interesting because there have been some graduations that Bill and uh, George W. Bush uh, preside over, and because, uh, you know, Bill picks uh, half of them, and George W. Bush picks half of them. You know, you've got a mix of Republicans and Democrats, independents, no affiliation. And it's so interesting because at these graduation events, uh, the Democrats go up to George W. Bush and say, what a great experience this has been. I, I, I can't thank you enough for being, you know, part of this, putting it together. And the Republicans go up to Bill. <laughs> and say, I've learned so much, and I'm so happy that I had this chance. So leadership is earned by the hard work of not only preparing and, and studying and trying to figure out what you would do if you got into leadership, but it's constantly learned by expanding your horizons, not shutting down, but opening up. And for me, that's one of the real... Uh, threats that we've got right now is people think somehow leadership is joining a team and never talking to anybody on the other team, uh, going into your corner and never coming out, uh, being a little echo chamber where you only hear the same things, you only listen to the same media, uh, you only have your beliefs, your, your biases uh, reinforced, instead of exposing yourself to different opinions and trying to learn from them. So. Leadership is earned in many different ways, but I don't think the earning ever ends. I think you have to keep uh, trying to become a better leader, to become a more empathetic leader, to become a more accomplished leader. And uh, you know that, that's hard work. It doesn't just happen because you hope for it. It happens because you really are determined to achieve it. 
I think one of the things you said in answering this question uh, really talks about the value of education and universities where you have people who have very different ideas and yet they're all welcome. We were talking about this a couple weeks ago among the deans of uh, public policy schools and we said there's really only two institutions in the United States that real, really allow different thoughts to sit side by side. One is the public library and the other is a university. And if you're starting to grow leadership where you're saying you're exposing people to real people, not just an idea that's the abstract, but real people, it can happen at a university where you're meeting people from a lot of different areas and studying different things. So I think this is another place where universities can really make a difference. Well, I, I agree with that. And I, I would only add that you, you, you should hope that it also happens in government, yes. it, that it happens in legislative bodies. You know, um, when I ran for the Senate and was elected in 2000, before I arrived, the then uh, Republican majority leader, Trent Lott, said, well, maybe lightning will strike and she won't actually uh, come. <laughs> By the end of my eight years, because we had worked together on a yeah. few things, and including uh, the devastation of Katrina, uh, which had yes. hit Mississippi as, as well as Louisiana and Alabama so badly. Um, you know, he was telling people, oh, you know, it was great to work with her. She has good ideas and she'll, you know, she'll come and try to help us get things done. So my time, my eight years, um, even though there was a lot of change going on and some of these conditions we were talking about earlier were really beginning. We didn't have an internet to speak of. We didn't have social media to speak of in the way that we certainly have it now. And people spent more time actually talking and listening to each other and spending time with each other and looking for ways to you know, find that common cause. So it should be happening in government. And the fact that we are so divided, so partisan right now, is really a loss. It's a loss for the process, but it's a loss for the individuals. It's a, you know, I spent a lot of time with John McCain, and you know, we worked together on a few things. Uh, he and I actually raised money for Brooks Medical Center uh, uh, in San Antonio for a lot of our returning uh, wounded warriors. We spent time together, we traveled together. We didn't end up agreeing on everything, but he was always somebody who wanted to learn from other people and he particularly sought out people that on the surface didn't look like they had you know, much in agreement with him. Um, we've lost a lot. That respect, we, too. Well, the respect right. and, and, and the, the sense of um, connectivity in a, in a common enterprise, namely being uh, in, the, in the Congress, in the Senate together. So I, I don't know how you rebuild that because a lot of what you have to do is just create situations again where people will spend time with each other. And that's harder and harder yeah. uh, in uh, the environment in which we find ourselves. So yes, I mean, education is key, but continuing education, yes. uh, trying to create more opportunities for people to find themselves with those who they think are different and finding out, hey, guess what? We actually have some things in common would go a long way toward perhaps uh, breaking down some of these barriers uh, that have been constructed. I think grounding that value and, and getting people to understand the importance of it and then they grow, it's sort of like a muscle. You know, the more you use it, the stronger it gets. So I think that's one of the roles that we play um, at, at our schools and our universities is to try to get that, that grounded um, and get that, it's a value for the rest of your life. So I want to ask you, you and I are grandmothers. Uh, and when I think about my two grandsons and when you think about your granddaughter and grandson, what do you hope when they're you know, finishing, they're entering their adulthood, what do you hope for them in terms of what this United States of America will be? Well, you, you know what it's like to have these grandchildren and it does, um, you know, just throw your mind into the future because you want them to, you know, have the best opportunities that they can take advantage of. But you know, it's not enough. Yeah. You know, it's not enough for your grandsons or my, you know, two grandchildren to be given a great education, which of course we will, you know, try to make sure they get to be, you know, well equipped to deal with, uh, 
the future and try to have some ideas about what they want to do, that's great. But if they come of age in an America that is divided and polarized and where ancient hatreds are being given free reign and where people are acting as though we are aliens in our own country with one another, it, it is not what I hope for them. And if the world that they come of age in is you know, divided and you have more authoritarians and the authoritarians are using technology uh, to control the minds and the behaviors of the people uh, in their countries and there uh, is fear, there's not hope, there's fear, fear of the other all the time, I will feel very sad. I, I probably won't be around, but I will be really sorry that the age of, of time when I became, you know, not just a child, but a teenager and a young woman that was so filled with possibility has shrunken instead of continuing to expand and that we have failed uh, miserably to deal with the problems that their generation will face, whether it is figuring out what we will do about technology, how we will deal with artificial intelligence and robotics and the loss of jobs that will flow from that, how we will uh, either reap the, you know, the whirlwind or figure out ways to mitigate uh, the uh, disasters uh, in the future from climate change, how we will come to grips with you know, making our country you know, more equal and provide that opportunity for everyone. If we're not even trying anymore, if we're not part of a larger mission, something bigger than ourselves, I will be really sad. So part of the reason I stay in the arena is because of them. You know, I want to be able to say to them when they're old enough to understand it, you know, I, I, I tried to do this and a lot of people worked together and we got this done and that's gonna make it better for you but it's also gonna make it better for everybody. I think it's going to require a, a real level of commitment by people who are grandparents like us uh, not to walk away from the problems we face today, but to support those who are in the arena all the time, who are struggling to make a difference, who are trying to prevent the you know, demeaning of the rule of law and the delegitimizing of elections and the attack on facts and evidence and truth. Because if they will only speak up for their own children, that will benefit all of our children. And so I'm hopeful, but I'm also going to do everything I can to try to keep pushing uh, forward and holding people accountable who don't tell the truth, who refuse to deal with the problems we have, who are captive to corporate interests, our ideological interests, or religious interests, and therefore turning their backs on you know, the common humanity that we share and the common uh, challenges for the common future that we face. So uh, that's what I hope we will do and that's what a place like the LBJ School can help do because, you know, every conference you hold, every publication you put out, every student you graduate, uh, they may not all agree, that's not what you're looking for, but they will have a mindset that will not be lazy and will mm -hmm. not be manipulated into agreeing with falsehoods and private agendas instead of striving for the public good. And I can't think of anything more important to do than that right now. That's true. It makes it all the more personal when you, you know, when you're really thinking about your grandchildren. And, and, and the other thing you're talking about, it, when you work with people, you're working with somebody who's a human, who they can't uh, demonize in some way. You really get to know people in a way that's very different. I have one last question, and that is, you have been in a political arena your whole life. 
and you you just said I want to stay in the arena. How are you redefining your role in that, or are you redefining your role in that arena? How where are you going in terms of that? Well, I I think um, you know this group that I started onward together. We're already. Uh, beginning to plan for next year and the year after next, um, you know, we we you know supported these groups, um, raised money to do that, and supported candidates, raised money, and and uh, supported their campaigns. I'm going to keep doing that because I I want to really lend a helping hand to a lot of these young entrepreneurial political uh, figures that are making a difference. I also think we've got to do more um, to tell a story about our country. And so I'm getting more interested in how we use the media to tell that story. So for example, I'm going to be an executive producer on, um, a, uh, uh, on bringing a book to the screen or the streaming, s streaming service called The Woman's Hour, which is about mm. the final battle uh, to win suffrage for American women, which happened in the summer of uh, 1920. So we will have 100 years of uh, women's suffrage to celebrate in 2020. And the story is so contemporary because the arguments that were made for and against women having the vote um, sound really familiar. Uh, the role that race played and you know, what black women were seeking to achieve because you know, they didn't want to be and, and, and knew that they had to fight not to be left behind. The interests that came in to try to prevent the last uh, state, because that's where the book focuses on, the last state, Tennessee, where it was make or break time and the railroad interests and the textile interests and the gas and oil interests were all lobbying against women's suffrage. So it's a, it's a look back, uh, it's a historical context and it's got great characters uh, who can carry the story, but it also has a lot of current uh, relevance. So telling these stories as a way of uh, kind of reminding people or teaching people about our history and that it's never end and it never ends. You have to keep, you know, redoing it and fighting and standing up against uh, the status quo and the forces that want to put you down and keep you back. Uh, but it's, it's possible and, and, and victory, success is possible. And the Tennessee story is especially rich because it came down to one vote. Uh, and how that one vote actually uh, was cast in favor of suffrage. So I'm, I'm really uh, looking at ways of how we can use uh, culture and social media mm -hmm. to tell these stories and to maybe uh, cause people to think about what we're doing today and what role they could play. And I'm, I'm really excited about that because I think it's, it's a, a means of um, telling the broader uh, truth uh, that you may not be able to convey if you're just arguing about uh, a specific candidate or a specific piece of legislation. We look forward to, to that. So on behalf of everyone here tonight, I really want to thank you so much for all you've done for the country. Uh, we look forward to what you're going to continue to do for the country. And, uh, you know, I really, again, feel, I hope you feel, and we talked about this, I hope you feel the positive energy uh, in our school and in this auditorium with all these folks here to thank you so much for all you've done for all of your adult life. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.